Well, thanks for the introduction, Matt, and it's a real um, pleasure to be here 10 years on. How, how did that happen? Where did that go? Um, I think I, I talked at one of the very first editions of, of this um, conference, so it, it's a real pleasure to be back. Um, I guess in the, the, the 10 years or, or so, um, some things have stayed the same, as Matt said, some things that have moved on. Um, and I think yeah, that's reflected in what I'm going to talk about um, today. Today, after a, a short introduction, I'm going to give three short stories of um, recent projects in, uh, in this area that we've been working on overall about the sort of same length of time as the, the Catalysis Hub. We started this about 10 years ago. And what links all of these three stories um, together is our interest in making sustainable fuels. So here's something that hasn't changed. This is a, a typical West Country um, rush hour scene. Um, something else that hasn't changed, of course, is that most of these vehicles will be burning a non-renewable um, fossil fuel. Um, but the, as Matt says at the beginning, that there has been progress um, as well. Certainly, electrification of, of transportation has really taken off in the past 10 years. In terms of um, liquid fuels uh, as well, there's been great progress. So if we look at, um, for instance, using waste as a, a source of carbon for making fuels, there's now plants at the, the demonstration scale or even um, commercial scale in taking municipal um, waste and turning that um, via modifications of Fischer-Tropsch chemistry into, um, into sustainable jet fuel. Um, if we look at renewable biomass, well, again, in the past 10 years now, the, the petrol that we buy in the forecourt in the UK um, will typically have about 5% of bioethanol um, in there as well. And there are, there are limitations with that and problems with that that I'll, I'll talk about, but, but some progress nevertheless. So this is probably a good time to, to talk about some of the sustainable liquid fuels that we could be targeting. Um, Bioethanol I've already mentioned, and this is a, a potential alternative to gasoline. Um, there are problems with that, um, and as I said, I'll, I'll explore that. Um, biodiesel, so uh, FAMES, fatty acid methyl esters, these have been around a long time. So, you know, very often you see kind of lorries going down the motorway saying um, powered by used um, cooking oils or, or so on. Um, very established technology. I, I thought there was nothing really here to, to do, but, but I think there are still problems with this. And I, I'll talk about one of these a little bit later. And of course, another area that's really taken off, if you'll excuse the pun, is uh, synthetic aviation fuels, um, SAFs, where I think, again, catalysis has a huge role to play um, in some of these materials. And, and we're not working on this, not working on it yet anyway, but I think lots of potential in this area. So I'm going to start off talking about the, the bioalcohols, bioethanol. And um, I've showed this slide many times before, comparing the fuel characteristics of ethanol compared to standard petrol, standard gasoline. Um, and there are clearly problems with using ethanol as a fuel. For a start, the energy density is rather lower than that of gasoline. It's only two thirds. So you need to burn more of this to, to travel the same distance. Um, another problem is the, um, the water affinity and, and the corrosion. Um, this can be um, kind of really limiting and damage um, engine lifetime. And, and all of that put together means that the maximum sort of blend ratios we can use for bioethanol mixed in with standard petrol is about 5%, the sort of amount that we, we buy on the forecourt um, at the minute. If we compare ethanol to butanol, you can see that butanol actually is a much better fuel. The fuel characteristics here, much closer to that of standard um, gasoline. So in fact, you, know, you could blend more of this into gasoline. Actually, with very small um, modifications, you could actually run a, a standard petrol car on um, biobutanol without any problems. So, if we compare butanol and ethanol, I guess there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, butanol is clearly a much better fuel, but how do we make um, biobutanol sustainably? There are industrial biotech routes um, to do that, but actually it's a very difficult bacterial fermentation, um, very wet, very low yields, um, challenges associated with that. 
Ethanol, on the other hand, well, you know, since antiquity, we know how to brew stuff to make ethanol. Um, and certainly there are fuel scale um, breweries um, that exist to, to make bioethanol, but it's a relatively poor fuel. So um, our starting point to this problem, which, as I said, came about 10 years ago, was to say, well, can we use catalysis to upgrade bioethanol into the much better fuel molecule, um, butanol? And that was, our, that was our starting point for all of this area. Well, this is where uh, the Gerbe reaction um, comes in, which was in the title of, of the talk. It was a very simple reaction, actually a very challenging one to do in reality. But in the Gerbe reaction, we have what seems, at least on paper, to be the ideal reaction to do this. I said this is an old reaction, over 120 years old, um, first developed by Marcel Gerbe, um, a Breton chemist. Um, and in this um, reaction, I'm going to tangle with the pointer now we start off with um start off with our um, alcohol this is dehydrogenated to get the aldehyde and then the key carbon carbon bond forming reaction here is just an aldol condensation so a base catalyzed aldol condensation uh, that gives us the longer chain material and then after rehydrogenation we get the longer chain alcohol so um Really, the transition metal catalyst here, I think it's important to note, is just a hydrogen transfer catalyst. The kind of all the, you know, the, all of the design of, that we go into the catalyst, most of it is in the transition metal part. That is just taking hydrogen out of the alcohol and rehydrogenating later. Actually, the carbon carbon bond forming um, reaction just base catalyzed um, aldol um, chemistry. So, to cut a lot, a lot of work into one slide, um, basically we developed catalysts that work very well um, for this. You can see the first patents in this area were around the time we were thinking about the, the catalyst hub the, the first time. We found that the best catalysts were um, ruthenium catalysts based on small bitangle diphosphine ligands. Um, and crucially, these were very selective catalysts. Um, so it turned out one of the big challenges here was that if we try to do this with ethanol to make butanol, the acetaldehyde is extremely reactive, and it's very difficult to tame that and stop at the C4 molecule. These ruthenium catalysts gave us very good selectivity to do that. So that's by way of introduction. I'm now going to move into the, um, the first um, of the short stories here, which is about tuning selectivity. Clearly, there are... There are four different butanol isomers. All of them have different fuel characteristics. Some are better than others. Some have other uses as well. And, and it'd, be a, it'd be really useful if we could make a specific isomer on purpose. Um, making one butanol, N-butanol, is something that we've, we've done to date. Um, it's relatively straightforward to make isobutanol, which is actually a much better fuel molecule by doing a Gerbe reaction with mixtures of methanol and ethanol. But 2-butanol also is an interesting molecule. It's a better fuel molecule than 1-butanol. Um, and it's also a useful intermediate for making things such as methyl ethyl ketone, which can be used as solvents and other intermediates. So um, really, a, a long-running study here was how we can tune selectivity. So we've studied many catalysts, but, but here's, I, I guess, some of our, um, some of our preferred um, catalysts. Um, so when we're screening catalysts um, for a start, we tend to use these um, simine-coordinated um, derivatives. Oh, where's the pointer gone? There we go. Um, very straightforward just to kind of mix the, the, um, the simine chloride dimer here with a phosphine ligand. That allows you to screen ligands um, very quickly. In fact, what we think happens in most catalytic reactions is that we get a ligand redistribution reaction and we end up making things that look um, more like on the right hand side here where we have bis ligand complexes um, you can see these work uh, work relatively well certainly good selectivity in all cases and, and variable um, conversion depending on the conditions um, these have i guess different advantages and, and disadvantages between the, um, the the different systems but as a rule the small bitangle phosphines work very well the other ligands that work well are mixed donor PN type um, ligands. So this first project actually started off as a, a final year undergraduate um, project and, and started with a, 
a very, I guess, simple idea in, in saying, OK, well, these bis bidentate PN ligands seem to work quite well. What happens if we just join the two ends of these um, ligands together and make a single tetradentate PNNP donor ligand? Um, very familiar sorts of ligands in homogeneous catalysis, lots of, used for lots of organic transformations, and um, really just exploratory chemistry to see what would happen here. Um, many ligands of this type we could have um, looked at. Um, th these are the ones that we did look at. So, um, so the catalyst one um, for comparison here. Um, two and three are made by, I won't go into the synthesis, but it's very simple condensation chemistry to make the imines. And then you can reduce those um, just with sodium borohydride to make the, uh, the amine derivatives as well. And, and you can imagine we can make a whole library of these types of ligands. Um, and start to explore these. So looking at these under our um, standard conditions, so, um, so we've got um, catalyst um, one here, which is you know, one of our best butanol um, catalysts. You can see making 94% um, butanol in terms of selectivity. Um, if we come to the others, you can see, okay, well, the, the conversion is sort of similar for, for all of these, around 15% you know, or a, a little bit less. But really, at first glance, these are very poor catalysts for making one butanol. Um, you know, around sort of about sixteen to, to twenty-nine percent. So, you know, considerably worse in terms of selectivity. And in fact, the major product with these catalysts is ethyl acetate. Um, as you'll see, this is something that shouldn't be surprising. Actually, chemistry to take ethanol and turn it into ethyl acetate is a commercial process. Um, Davy Technology have developed a, a process um, doing that, a very nice, sustainable way to make uh, ethyl acetate from bioethanol. And so it, it seems that we have switched the selectivity in going to the tetradentate ligand. What was also intriguing is that we seem to make 2-butanol um, here. The 2-butanol goes hand in hand with the ethyl acetate. And, and you know, we're not making a, a lot of that, but, you know, 10, 14 percent with, with some of these catalysts reasonable amounts of 2-butanol. And we really, um, it seemed to be much more complex than maybe we, we first thought here. So this is a, this is a reaction scheme, scheme to show how we can put this together. I showed you the, um, uh, the scheme just for Gerbe chemistry. Actually, this is just one of a, a series of possibilities um, that we could have here. So starting with ethanol, if we do a dehydrogenation reaction, we get to the acetaldehyde. Uh, what we want to happen is have a base catalyzed aldol reaction. We then um, undergo the dehydration to get the um, um, croton aldehyde. Um, and then after rehydrogenation gives us the, the one butanol. Competing um, with that is that, again, if we start up here with the, um, the ethanol, we can have the acetaldehyde, but this now undergoes um, the well-known Tyshenko chemistry to make ethyl acetate. Um, actually, in the presence of, of water, we can have um, sodium hydroxide by Cannizzaro chemistry gives us sodium acetate as well. I'll talk about this um, in the, the last part of the talk. This can be a problem. But from the aldol products, we can also have either via a series of hydrogenation, rehydrogenation reactions, or just via a, a direct sort of isomerization reaction, we can get to this ketone primary alcohol product. If we dehydrate this and then rehydrogenate, this gets us down to the 2-butanol product. So you can see a really complex interconnecting series of hydrogenations, dehydrogenation, hydration, dehydration reactions. And if you go to higher temperature, Ledbedev chemistry to make butadiene comes into play um, as well. So really a whole series of very complex reactions, which I think actually are, are, you know, warrant further study to, to really look at the mechanism here. But certainly this accounts for how we could be seeing 1-butanol, 2-butanol, and ethyl acetate. I said that the chemistry to make ethyl acetate is well known. So there's a commercial process. There are also homogeneous catalysts that, that do this. One of the best is this tridentate PNP um, ligand, sometimes called Rumacho, um, this catalyst. Um, so um, Bella and, and others have reported this, calling this um, acceptalous dehydrogenative coupling. 
Um, and this works with very high conversion, very high selectivity to make ethyl acetate. It's worth noting the conditions here are slightly different to our conditions. We tend to be at a pretty high temperature, certainly for a homogeneous catalytic system, sort of 150, 180 degrees. This tends to be in uh, refluxing ethanol. This is also in an open vessel. So we make two molecules of hydrogen for every molecule of ethyl acetate um, here. So this is done in an open vessel to kind of to bubble off the hydrogen. So we thought it interesting to look at our catalysts under these conditions. We're making ethyl acetate, but maybe we, uh, you know, we're hindering the catalyst by not looking at the ideal conditions to, uh, to do that. So if we compare looking at this um, under ethanol reflux, uh, but either closed and, and, and comparing that with an open vessel, you can see with catalyst one, which was one of our best catalysts for making one butanol, Actually, this still makes one butanol. Um, the kind of the selectivity goes down um, a little bit, but even with an open vessel, this catalyst really wants to make one butanol. However, looking at catalyst two, which was um, the, the tetradentate one, which remember made a mixture of ethyl acetate and two butanol, and a close condition, it, it made a bit of um, one butanol, but made two butanol and ethyl acetate. If we now go to the open vessel conditions, we switch it right over to making ethyl acetate. This is just basically a good acceptalous dehydrogenative coupling catalyst. Okay, so the conditions are important here. Um, we've looked at our catalysts under the best conditions for acceptalous dehydrogenative coupling. Uh, we thought it also interesting to look at the best catalyst for acceptalous dehydrogenated coupling under our conditions. What do those tridentate PNP ligands do? Um, and it turns out that they do something very interesting. So, um, you know, maybe if we start in the, in the middle here, so at sort of 180 degrees, which is the, the typical sort of um, temperature that we would use for um, the Gerbe chemistry, um, quite small amounts of the base, we get reasonable conversion. Um, and this still makes ethyl acetate. But now, you know, really quite a significant amount of 2-butanol. If we go down in temperature to, to 120, now actually we're making more 2-butanol than ethyl acetate. And if we start to increase the amount of base we have in the system, in fact, now we can get to systems where we're making over 70% of 2-butanol um, with these systems. So to draw the first part together, I think yeah, what we've shown is this relatively simple um, sequence of, of mixed bidentate, tridentate, or tetradentate PN ligands, we can switch the selectivity from making one butanol on purpose through to, as a majority product, making two butanol um, on purpose, and you know, something we didn't expect when we, uh, we started this. Okay, so moving into the, the second um, the second part, I said that at the beginning that you know we largely considered biodiesel to be a solved problem um, and, and not an awful amount to, to do in that area. However, you know what I didn't realize talking to some of our contacts in industry is there are still some really significant disadvantages to um, to biodiesel. And one of the problems with biodiesel at the minute is its low temperature performance. Um, so this is how, to remind you, this is how we make uh, the, the fame molecules. You know, this is taught in schools now as an example of a transesterification um, reaction, just taking um, a triglyceride oil containing crop, doing a simple esterification with methanol to make the, the um, methyl esters. And the, the R group here will, you know, will be a variety of saturated and or unsaturated linear chains um, depending on the, the crop that's used to make this. The problem with these materials at low temperature is that those long chains basically tend to crystallize. They tend to solidify at, at low temperatures. Um, so apologies, this, this um, picture was taken from an American company. So the temperature gauge here is in Fahrenheit. Um, this, this is at 32 Fahrenheit, which, um, so basically this is, you know, this is freezing. Um, and these are, these are not oils, despite the labels. These are bio, methyl ester biodiesels made from these particular oils. 
Um, you can see that they look rather different depending on the crops, but certainly by the time we're looking at, at something, you know, like the soya bean or the peanut oils over here, we've essentially got um, solids or at least extremely viscous liquids um, that you couldn't, simply couldn't use as a fuel at these temperatures. Um, so fuel scientists tend to, to measure this property. The two important um, parameters here are the cloud point and the pour point. I won't go into what they mean. Basically, the pour point, roughly speaking, is the, the point at which you can no longer pour this um, out of, of a vessel. It becomes too viscous um, to pour. And you can see for some standard sort of um, methyl esters from these crops, those pour points are really surprisingly high in temperature. Um, so for something like a, a, a palm oil um, fame, you know, the pour point, pour point is 15 degrees Celsius, which you know, is a pretty kind of balmy summer's day um, in, uh, in Oxfordshire, isn't it? Um, and you, know, when you, um, you can improve that looking at, at different um, crops here, but, but too high to use. I mean, looking at this, it, it makes you wonder how you can use these fuels at all. Um, and the fact that we can use them at all is the fact that lots of additives go into these sorts of methyl esters, which basically break up the crystallinity and mean that you can improve um, this performance. Clearly, you know, we can think of another way that you could improve the performance if um, crystallization of these linear chains is a problem is to start to put a branch um, in there. And people have done that simply by um, making the esters with isopropanol um, rather than methanol. Um, and this really does improve things. So you can see, you know, you get an improvement of about 10 degrees C by going to an isopropyl ester here. Um, the problem is where the isopropanol comes from at, um, at fuel scale from a sustainable source. So this is, this is where we started. And we thought that um, Gerbet chemistry might have um, a role to play here. So... So this was our idea. Let's, let's start off with our um, fatty acid methyl ester um, up here. And if we hydrogenate this, that there are many catalysts out there now which are very successful in ester hydrogenation. And that will take us down to a long chain alcohol um, and a molecule of methanol. And now if we do Gerbet chemistry with this, we can do a cross Gerbet reaction between the long chain alcohol and the methanol and that will insert a beta methyl branch into our long chain alcohol. And that methyl branch should have a similar sort of improvement to the low temperature performance as putting an isopropyl group in there. In fact, maybe we can go even further here and start directly from the triglyceride oil. Um, and maybe, you know, if we start with this, we can also hydrogenate that. That's going to make the long chain alcohol and make glycerol as a side product. We'll then need to add methanol um, but if we do that, it, it, we can go directly to make these um, branched materials. So what are the catalysts that do this? Well, I've showed you some of the best catalysts for doing Gerbet chemistry already. Um, by happy coincidence, these are also some of the best homogeneous catalysts that are out there for doing ester hydrogenation. So potentially in a one pot tandem reaction here, we should be able to go directly um, from a fame molecule through to a branched alcohol and to upgrade those flames into something that have a much better low temperature performance. Well, rather than starting with the, the kind of the real fuel molecules here, the analysis of these is rather complex. Um, we started with something more simple. We started with methyl propanoate and see if we can do this uh, tandem chemistry here. Um, and we separated the steps out for a start. So we, we started just looking at the hydrogenation um, of this. You'll see that catalyst um, two here, actually, you know, this um, under a variety of conditions, I'm just giving one of them here. This was actually um, less good as the um, ester hydrogenation catalyst. A far better catalyst was the tridentate ruthenium catalyst, um, catalyst six, um, at sort of, you know, 40, um, 40 bar 100 degrees, we, we're getting pretty much quantitative conversion over um, reasonable amounts of time. Um, we wanted to look at a variety of conditions. If you're doing tandem catalysis, it's always a bit of a compromise to, to get both steps um, to work. Um, certainly, this still works reasonably well if we go to lower um, um, pressures of hydrogen. We're also interested in going to um, higher temperatures. Uh, the Gerbet chemistry tends to go at, uh, at higher temperature. 
this still works um, very well at 150. So, so the hydrogenation chemistry here seems to work very well. The Gerbe chemistry um, here, um, this also um, works reasonably well. We're getting decent yields of, of isobutanol here by doing the, the cross Gerbe of propanol um, and methanol. Um, if we run this for longer, we get a, a higher yield. Um, we do unfortunately need a lot of base um, to get this to go. I'm gonna talk about that in the, the last part um, of the talk. It's a bit of a technological problem here. We need, we need a lot of base, but the Gerbe chemistry works um, fine for making well, isobutanol as is the model compound here. So putting all of this um, together with Catalyst 6, we have to play around with the conditions a little bit. Um, if we um, start at 180 degrees, 30 bar of pressure of hydrogen to do the hydrogenation, you can see um, we, we stop at the propanol, so not all of this is converted in the Gerbe chemistry, but we're still making a, a reasonable yield of isobutanol um, and reasonable selectivity in the liquid fraction to make that. If we go to slightly lower temperature, 150, the hydrogenation chemistry works absolutely fine, but we stop at the um, propanol. Uh, the Gerbe chemistry is, um, is much slower now. Um, if we go to um, um, slightly higher pressure, we can push this um, a little bit more. So now we can get up to sort of 40% um, yield of making isobutanol with good selectivity. Again, go to lower temperature, we just stop after doing the hydrogenation. Um, it seems that adding hydrogen into the mixture does hinder some of the, the Gerbe chemistry. But this seems to work in principle that we can do this tandem, um, tandem reaction. And so, um, so we started to look at some of the, um, the real materials here. So we went straight in for looking at some of the triglyceride oils, um, a, a range of different um, lengths here. And yeah, we continue in to, to study this, looking at some of the unsaturated ones in particular. Um, but you can see this works directly with the oils um, as well. So we can take um, directly, for instance, if we look at the one at the bottom here, a long chain um, oil, we can insert a methyl branch, reasonable yield and selectivity to make something which is gonna be um, a much improved biodiesel molecule. The side products are interesting here. Of course, we've got glycerol as a side product, which can also undergo some of these Gerbe reactions. It makes a horrible mess. We've not managed to fully analyze that, but I think there's probably some interesting chemistry in that we need to look at in due course. So that's the, the second story um, coming into the, the final story now. So, uh, you know, a shorter one and, and one which is, is kind of very much a work in progress, but I think something which um, is interested and I want to, you know, want to share today more in the spirit of a, a paper for um, discussion. And that's rather than looking at basic Gerbe chemistry, looking at Lewis acids in Gerbe chemistry. And this comes to one of the um, real technological problems with developing this chemistry. Um, there are you know, a series of technological problems. Um, catalyst lifetime and recycling is always an issue. And um, this is a homogeneous catalyst. So of course that is more difficult. Um, homogeneous catalyst can be run on scale. Look at hydroformylation. You know, this, uh, this is um, possible, but clearly moving to a, a solid catalyst would simplify that. A big problem here, though, is the saponification reactions with the base. Um, I touched on this before. If we've got sodium ethoxide in there under Gerbe conditions, if we have some water, we always get this competing side reaction to make ethyl acetate. Um, so this is degrading our base. We've always basically got a race between degrading the base and doing the Gerbe chemistry, which is why we have to put so much base in there um, in some times. People, to be honest, are a little bit dishonest in how they report results in this area, just that the convention is people talk about selectivity in the liquid phase, um, and, and often that can be very high. But actually, if you do this more carefully and look at the full mass balance, often a lot of that mass balance goes into solid products. It ends up in the sodium acetate. Um, if you're looking at methanol, you tend to get... Um, sodium formate or, or sodium carbonate um, as well. And up to 50% of the, the mass of the substrates can actually end up in these pretty worthless side products. So this is a very significant problem if we want to commercialize this. And 
Um, and we've looked at lots of ways to get around this. Um, so if we go back to our Gerbe scheme, you know, we've tried lots of different transition metal catalysts. And that's not really the problem here. The, the problem is, is the base and the water. Uh, we've looked at removing the water. And certainly, if you go to more of a continuous process under low water conditions, that can give big advantages and, and you know, th that improves things. But remember what I said right at the beginning, that the transition metal catalyst here um, is just doing hydrogen transfer reactions. Actually, the carbon-carbon bond forming reaction is just an aldol condensation. And in Gerbe chemistry, for the past 120 years, that aldol condensation has been base catalyzed, but aldol condensations can also be Lewis acid catalyzed. So can we just get rid of the base completely, use a Lewis acid to do the aldol condensation, and then Lewis acids don't catalyze all of these saponification reactions, and that problem should go away. So yeah, it looks a small change, but nobody's managed to do this in 120 years. So, so you know, clearly you try some experiments and you very quickly realize why nobody uh, has done this yet. Um, we started off looking at some simple um, water tolerant Lewis acids. These sort of triflates are often used um, in organic synthesis uh, as being fairly robust Lewis acids. Um, basically a big row of zeros when it comes to making one butanol. We do get high conversion of the ethanol, um, but that is making diethyl ether. Um, so other on this table, you know, the 98% of other with these Lewis acids is diethyl ether. And when we did some um, in situ NMR experiments, we, we very quickly realized why that um, is the case. So if you take one of our standard um, catalysts here and you add the, the metal triflate, um, you know, we should have expected this. It, it undergoes a, a metathesis reaction, removes one of the chlorides, and makes a cationic triflate um, complex. And th there's good NMR evidence for that. You can make these sorts of cationic triflate complexes on purpose. And if you add ethanol to those, it turns out under our reaction conditions, they're extremely good catalysts for dehydrating ethanol to make diethyl ether. Um, so this is what's going on with that chemistry. Um, but not deterred. Um, so Sam, who a yeah, very good student who, who kind of um, looked at this, and, and Harry Jepson following him, clearly there's, there's many more Lewis acids we could look at and we, and we could look at yet. But they had more success when it looked at a very simple zirconium ethoxide um, as a Lewis acid. And this looks um, more promising. So, you know, the conversion... Um, is, is lower, but we're making now very little of the diethyl ether. And in fact, the major product here, 77%, is making one butanol. So we do seem to have a base free Lewis acid transition metal catalyzed Gerbe reaction. What was interesting with this as well is that you know, this is an honest selectivity. We made no solid side products at all. So we do seem to have solved this key technological issue. I said there was lots of Lewis acids we could um, look at. Actually, what Harry decided to do was, was try and solve some of these other problems we have here in terms of maybe moving towards a, a solid catalyst. So he was inspired by the fact that this zo um, zirconium ethoxide um, looks very similar to some of the UI66 um, zirconium MOF materials, where we have zirconium um, modes here, nodes here, terephthalic acid linkers, and a, a sort of solid state Lewis acidic um, material. Um, so he screened these to see if it would do the same sort of chemistry. Um, and actually, it works very well. Um, so with these um, MOFs now, okay, the, the selectivity is a, is a little bit lower. Actually, other now tends to be some of the higher alcohols. Um, but certainly, we can push this to, to what's pretty good conversion um, for this chemistry. Um, again, no solid side products. So no, there does seem to be an advantage there. Um, of course, one of the advantages of having a solid catalyst is now that we can start to look at some recycling um, experiments. Um, so just to, to finish, Harry started to, to look at this. So the, the red um, line here um, is the conversion. I think what's interesting is that when we run this the second time, the conversion goes down. But when we do it the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, it, it comes back again. 
That suggests to me there's some evolution of the catalyst going on as we recycle this. Um, clearly, that could be associated with the MOF structure. It could be associated um, with the ruthenium. I think the preliminary data we've got looking at the MOF structure, the powder XRD is the same. The MOF seems to be intact. That suggests to me that probably this homogeneous ruthenium catalyst is ending up as ruthenium nanoparticles. Um, those sorts of nanoparticle catalysts are also known to, to catalyze this. So clearly we've a lot more work to do here in terms of the characterization. Um, but I think really interesting in the, you know, what's a pretty fundamental change here in moving from a Lewis base to a Lewis acid. Um, and I think that opens many possibilities um, in this area of chemistry. So all that remains is to, to thank the people um, that did this work, uh, the people that funded this work, in particular BP, who have been you know, very long-term um, partners in all of this chemistry. Many thanks again for the invitation um, to talk, and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Duncan. And questions? Sure. Um, you uh, had a slide there where you had the triglycerides um, and you were talking about uh, doing the Ube reaction there to put the branch in to the uh, triglyceride to lower the pore point. Yeah. Um, have you actually performed those experiments? And if you have, how would that compare to sort of your standard hydroisomerization catalysts where you have a platinum or palladium on uh, an acidic um, uh, solid catalyst? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Of course, that's the next step. And what we're working on at the minute is getting sufficient amounts of those materials for, um, that are pure that we can hand over to our industry partners that are, are well-placed to do those sorts of tests. So the answer is we don't know yet. I'd have thought inserting a meth, well, who knows, inserting a methyl branch into the main chain rather than putting it on the isopropyl group. I'd have thought it would be the same, but those experiments are still to be done. Question. Um, I was interested in, until you said it makes a mess, yeah. not putting the methanol in the standard reaction. So you end up with polyol salt. Right? Yeah. Um, do you know why it makes a mess? No, we we don't. I mean, I think if if you kind of just look at glycerol as a as an alcohol um, with this sort of chemistry, if you you know if you if you've just got a complex sequence of dehydrogenation, dehydration reactions. There are just so many possible products that you can make there. I mean, certainly we've seen evidence for some of the um, kind of acrylic acid type molecules that, that you're getting there sometimes. Um, there are certainly things in there that are oligomeric um, as well. Um, we've really just you know, struggled with the, the analysis with that, with the small amounts we make. I mean, I think it it's probably worth looking at Gervais chemistry just with glycerol as a substrate and seeing what you make. So I think there's, there's potentially a, you know, some rich chemistry there in terms of um, controlling this, but not something we've looked at yet. Question from Tamina online, who's asking if you could explain the reason why the recyclability study second time went down. Yeah, I think that is because I think the my guess is that the nature of the ruthenium catalyst is changing the second time. So the first time that catalyst is probably the homogeneous catalyst is decomposing to some sort of nanoparticulate catalyst. When you actually wash that, you run it the second time, you're starting off with some sort of nanoparticulate catalyst, which is active but lower activity. As you recycle that many times, well, who knows? I mean, maybe the kind of the particle size shape is changing and um, we're getting something that works um, better. We have looked at um, on a separate project looking at, at nanoparticle catalysts. They do work, um, but it's a very sensitive function of how you make those nanoparticles. So it's maybe not surprising that that changes with time. Thank you. So, Charlie, I'm on a three line whip, so um, we're in the last one. Yeah. I've been wondering over the coffee. <laughs> I would just like to thank all three speakers for, for a fantastic session of uh, diverse catalytic chemistry. Thank you very much.